Ben Shapiro, MLK Day takes. Okay, so every Martin Luther King Jr. Day, you get a bevy of think pieces in left-wing media talking about in order to live up to the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr., we basically... I just want to say something. Ben Shapiro was against the civil rights movement. He, in modern day, United States of America, openly stated the Civil Rights Act is bad because it compels businesses, private businesses, to do things like forces them to serve black customers. Ben Shapiro has openly stated that. This is from a month ago. I do not think that the federal government had the power constitutionally or morally or philosophically to compel individuals not to engage in constitutionally protected behavior, even behavior I don't particularly like, like, for example, banning Jews at country clubs. I'm a Jew, not in favor of banning Jews at country clubs. I'm not in favor of banning black people from restaurants. Do I think that the government, the federal government, had the power to compel the individual bed and breakfast owner to determine it, to, that the federal government could override that person's priorities in, in terms of who they had in their house? No, I don't think the federal government had that power. He says that it is immoral, not the, not the act of like engaging in segregation as an individual business owner, but the federal government telling individual businesses they can't do that. He says it's unconstitutional, immoral, unjustifiable, and unethical. That's from a month ago, dog. He's wearing the same fucking shirt in this video as he is from one month ago. Ben Shapiro, and he said this time and time again, discussing the Civil Rights Act, says the legislation from the 60s was important in doing away with states' governments that promoted segregation, but that it overreached by attempting to compel individuals to not engage in behavior or action that could be seen as protected by the Constitution. This is his, like, I'm going to do racism shirt, I guess. I wanted to show that to you before we got into Ben Shapiro now, wearing, ironically, the same exact shirt, as he talks about MLK and his legacy, okay? On this day. MLK Day. Let's take a look. Okay, so every Martin Luther King Jr. Day, we get a bevy of think pieces in left-wing media talking about in order to live up to the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr., we basically have to engage in a woke Bernie Sanders redistributionist agenda. So today's example comes courtesy of Esau McCauley, writing for the New York Times. In 1968, four days before he was shot on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel, in Memphis, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his last Sunday sermon at the Washington National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. It was entitled Remaining Awake Through a Great Revolution. And although King doesn't say the word woke, he uses the concept as it was understood by many black folks then, well before the term was co-opted by the political right to refer to any left-leaning policy it wanted to condemn. The sermon is an opportunity to encounter the real King, who is too often obfuscated by politicians who use his legacy to support their own agendas. They contend that King was colorblind when in fact his policy aims were unapologetically color conscious. If that were- I mean, yeah, literally. One of his policy aims you are dissecting and agreeing against, which is, you know, the Civil Rights Act, which was uh, intended to destroy segregation across the board, including in private businesses. That in and of itself, other than like, we're not even talking about like MLK's legacy, what he actually truly believed in. Nobody in liberal media even ever will mention that he was a democratic socialist. He was like literally pro Ho Chi Minh, anti Vietnam War, anti imperialist, pro socialist. They will never mention that. Liberals don't want to mention that. Republicans don't want to mention that, partially because they're all right wing pieces of shit, right? They have whitewashed his legacy in that regard, aggressively so, okay? But this takes it one step further. When you take a guy whose entire lives work, okay, revolves around creating equality for black people and says, no, actually he is colorblind. You're wrong. To do, to do white supremacist agitprop, the gall, every year we do this, whether it be Black History Month or on MLK Day, every year we do this for an entire month of February and certainly on MLK Day where we look through a list of some of the most unhinged right-wing tweets from psychotic right-wingers very much would have been against MLK at the time or are still against MLK's ideas now, bastardizing his words and his moves and his movement to specifically do the most counterproductive thing on the planet, uplift, normalize, and defend white supremacist constructs. Or the part of Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday that we were actually celebrating? Okay, but that's not what we're celebrating. If you had asked people in 1983 when this was enshrined into federal law, are they in favor of a national holiday that enshrines the idea of group redistributionism? The answer is no. There would not have been support for that. The thing that every school child learns when they are in school about Martin Luther King Jr. is the I Have a Dream speech, right? One of the great speeches in American rhetorical history. That speech is replete with references to the idea that we should all view each other as God's creatures without reference to color. 
an attempt to backfill that by looking at the fact that Martin Luther King Jr. was economically socialistic does not change the fact that that is not what we are actually celebrating about Martin Luther King Jr. on Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And, and trying to claim that that is what we are celebrating is silly. I mean, 67% of uh, America was against MLK at the time of his assassination. 67%. So going back to that era and using what people thought about MLK or his agenda as a good metric is pretty fucking silly, I think. Especially if we are now living in 2023 and you understand that you're supposed to, you know, look at him as a positive figure, right? Because Ben Shapiro is not stupid enough to shit on MLK because that's like a pretty obvious way to be like, oh, you're a f***ing gigantic racist. It's so racist that other races will be like, oh, man, that's a that's a bridge too far, I think. Or that that's what we should be celebrating because in order to celebrate the part of the legacy we like, we have to celebrate the whole thing. Wrong. We don't have to celebrate his treatment of women and we don't have to celebrate his socialistic redistribution of Oh, here we go. At least he's honest about MLK's background to shit on him. His policies, I but like in a in a woke in a in a way that is like appropriate. There are a bunch of things about Martin Luther King Jr. that are not not the not the his treatment of women part. I'm talking about his socialism. Not worth celebrating, and then there are a bunch of things that are worth celebrating, and those are not the same thing. However, again, the idea here is that if you really, really want the Martin Luther King Jr. revolution, what you need is a compelling case for reparations based on the debt this country owes its black citizens. By the way, even if you were going to make this case in 1968, like directly in the aftermath of Jim Crow, it's very difficult to make that case in 2023. You're talking about half a century later. But says this columnist for King, waking up is not simply understanding that racism is bad. It is acknowledging that racism created generational wealth for white Americans and robbed black Americans of the same economic boost. The racial wealth gap King highlighted in his sermon not only persists, but according to some studies, is basically the same as it was in 1968. Well, then I have a question. The United States has undertaken the spending of tens of trillions of dollars in social redistributionist schemes, ranging from food stamps to welfare to government subsidized housing to government subsidized college admissions policy that is racially discriminatory in nature. And the wealth gap remains. Why is it that wealth gap remains when it has closed for virtually every other minority in the United States? The answer certainly has to do some with history, but a lot of it has to do with the fact that you have a 75 percent out of wedlock birth rate in the black community. Yeah, leave, dude, what a fucking slimy, gross loser, dude. Yo, even on MLK Day, you got to respect it a little bit. He's like, he is so insanely racist. He couldn't even, bro, he could not even take one day off from the racism. You know what I mean? He's just like, nope, I'm going to go extra hard on this day, okay? That's what MLK would want me to do. Jesus Christ, dude hitting all the high notes black people are born out of wedlock it's like dude there are two reasons okay there can only be two reasons as to why black people underperform in modern society in comparison to white people okay and we're talking about like middle class black american versus a middle class white american family their children and their children's performance is going to be drastically different okay it's true it's either external factors or internal factors Either black people have been held back in a systemic way, and if you understand American history, even when the most basic understanding of American history should allow you to recognize that it is actually black people being held back as a consequence of racism, as a consequence of slavery, as a consequence of segregation, and at no point has restitution been offered to black people in this country. It's never happened. Black people have still been weaponized, and their existence has still been weaponized, and they have been cast aside and pushed into uh, areas that are low income that have been purposely starved out. You've never corrected that wrong. You've never turned around and, and said, you know what? Actually, this is fucked up. Let's fix it. Okay. All of that is systemic. That's an external factor or it's internal. And that means that you believe black people are just genetically inferior. And that is precisely why they've been held back. That's just racism. That's white supremacy. And now, of course, it's, uh, it's, it's now considered a faux pas to be so open about your white supremacist values, which is precisely the reason why these guys dance around the subject. They say it's culture. It's culture. These pussies can't say race anymore, so they say it's culture. It's culture. Everybody consumes black culture. Why doesn't it impact? If, if it is simply a cultural difference, everybody consumes black culture, the most popular form of culture. Why is it that only black people supposedly are uh, you know impacted by this? It's external. It's systemic racism. But of course, these motherfuckers don't want to admit that because that would undermine their entire worldview because they're racist. That's it. You have dramatic educational underperformance in the black community. Now, you can go back to the original sin here and you can blame it on the original sin. And that's all, that's all well and good. But the decisions that are going to change the trajectory of the wealth gap in the United States are decisions that are made today. 
not by governments who sign checks. They're decisions made on an individual level to be responsible and to help make life better for your children. That is the story of how groups, generally speaking, rise in the what does birth rate out of wedlock have to do with these things? Some of the reasons as to why there is a statistical anomaly there or a disparity there, because there is one, is in the criminal justice system, okay? One out of five black children in this country have one parent that's incarcerated. That number goes up to one out of 42 for white people. The United States, members, individual members of the groups, not as groups, individual members of the groups make good decisions. And when they make good financial and personal decisions, the wealth in their family increases. And when the wealth in their family increases, it increases intergenerationally. This is how you cure the problem. I will agree with you about the problem with the evils of Jim Crow and slavery. Of course, of course. And I'll agree with you that that obviously puts some groups behind the eight ball to start with in 1965. But when you're talking about 2023 and the people who are now experiencing the wealth gap being born 40 years after the Civil Rights Act, then you got to start asking questions as to how do you choose to solve the problem? But the answer is that we are just going to say that we need to to recommend the same solutions that Martin Luther King Jr. was talking about. One in five incarcerated, but isn't it the fault of the person who committed the crime? Genuine question, because that will be the conservative's argument. Better call Saul. That's a great question. Crime, most crime, is not a consequence of people being evil or bad or wrong. Crime is a consequence of poverty. If you recognize the underlying material reasons as to why crime persists in certain communities, and you recognize that those certain communities have been held back specifically through systemic discrimination, you will now arrive at the truth about why black men are over-policed and also incarcerated at higher rates. There's also easy statistics to point to that even liberals will understand without trying to recognize the, the underlying material conditions. For example, like weed, black men and white men smoke weed at the same rates, Okay, but black men get longer sentences and also uh, are more likely to go to prison when they're caught with uh, this same amount of weed. They're arrested at four times the rate, despite the fact that they consume, uh, they, they, you know, use drugs at the same exact rate. It's codified in crack versus cocaine sentencing as well. Yes, that was a, a, a byproduct of the war on drugs. Shouts out to Joe Brandon. Black communities are consistently, historically, and in contemporary society underserved. They have less access to funds. They have been cast aside deliberately, systematically, and also are over-policed. The irony of that, the dark irony of that situation, the circumstances is really dire. When you think about it, black people go to work. They pay taxes. Okay, those taxes then fund the same police force that ends up jailing their children, jailing their friends, jailing their neighbors. So black people are literally black people literally end up fucking paying the people that kill them on the streets, the people that jail them, the people that jail their families by over policing them, by putting them inside of the system early on. It's a crazy process. Which is why you have another column in the Washington Post today by Perry Bacon Jr. saying the racial reckoning led to lots of talk, but little real change. And he points out many American leaders and institutions will honor the legacy of the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. on Monday and pledge to work toward his goals. But they also most certainly won't sound as committed to black causes as they did in the weeks immediately following Floyd's murder by Minneapolis police. Well, right. I mean, that's because in the aftermath of, of George Floyd's killing by Derek Chauvin, essentially, you had a bunch of woke virtue signaling. People didn't look at the original situation of the case and say there is no evidence of actual racial bias in this particular case. There's a lot of evidence, in fact, that, that George Floyd was yeah. a kite. He can make no, no, famously, uh, famously, there was, uh, there was none, of course. You know, cops just brutally execute white people on like a, a on a, on a fake check charge regularly in front of like 40 people. They, that happens so frequently, man. Sentencing disparities, <clears throat> None of that exists. Uh, Over-policing, none of that exists. It's just a fabrication and not a byproduct of a otherwise white supremacist system of existence. Make the case, and the case apparently was made to the satisfaction of the jury, if not to my own satisfaction in court, that Derek Chauvin was responsible for his death. Again, I think the evidence there is really, really sketchy, but okay. This man hit all the high notes. He said black people are fatherless uh, and just left it there. He said uh, George Floyd was not executed by a racist cop cop was not racist i mean he's hitting dude mlk day baby he's hitting all the high notes but nobody even alleged that that was the result of racism that derek chauvin was a racist who decided to kill a black man that day and yet it didn't matter the entire country decided they were going to virtue signal on this basis and then when it came down to actual policy they didn't actually do anything why because it turns out the vast majority of americans don't agree with racially redistributionist policy and so i understand why there are people like perry bacon jr who are mad that, that that america virtue signal and then didn't do the stuff that they wanted i get it they feel fib to because they were fib to mainly by a bunch of left-wing media types who decided that they were going to pay lip service 
to the Black Lives Matter cause without actually embracing the Black Lives Matter agenda. And by the way, the, the policies that are being advocated are bad. The policies that are being advocated by Black Lives Matter, the policies that were advocated by Martin Luther King in 1968, even if they were temporarily justifiable, would have been bad in the short, medium and long term. And yet those policies are still being advocated today. So, for example, you have The New York Times today arguing in favor of affirmative action. Affirmative action has been one of the giantest fails in American political history. As mentioned, the wealth gap in the United States has not been alleviated. The notion that affirmative action, which was necessary in order to leverage black students who were underperforming on standardized tests into top level universities, that this would heal the income and wealth gap in the United States was a lie. It is not true. It creates misalignment. It creates higher dropout rates. It means that that people who actually didn't need affirmative action in order to get into their schools are looked at askance wrongly. Oh, okay, I can't, I can't do this. I can't do the rest of this. Okay, I, I will lose my mind. Listen, affirmative action is a bandage solution. It's not the best one, but it's the only one that liberals have like been able to push forward. <clears throat> and unfortunate for Ben Shapiro, reality of of uh, you know racial wounds being healed is that if you are segregating on the basis of race. And if you are underserving communities on the basis of race, a fact that even I believe Ben Shapiro recognizes, uh, in spite of all of his uh, you know, best interest to, to make it seem like it's not the case, he still recognizes that to a certain degree. He admits that racism is bad. He admits that racism did exist at a certain point. Okay, The only way to solve historic wrongs that surrounded race is by offering restitution based on race. That's just how it works. You might not like it, but that's how it fucking works.